My name is Kristen Deedy. I'm the Glass Education Administrator here at Salem Community College. Um, I have the great privilege of not only overseeing this fantastic Glass Center and the, um, I get to take part in both academic programs and our extracurricular workshops. And I'm just here to do all I can for our incredible students here at the college. Um, it's the most amazing job on the planet. I'm a very lucky person. <laughs> Um, I'm also very fortunate and honored this evening to introduce you all to internationally acclaimed artist and pioneer and a pioneer in the studio glass movement, Paul J. Stankard. Paul is considered a living master who translates nature in glass. You can find his work represented in over 80 museum collections around the world. Paul is the recipient of numerous awards and honorary doctorate degrees. He most recently received the Master of the Medium Award from Smithsonian's the James Renwick Alliance and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Glass Art Society. Paul is also an artist in residence and honorary professor here at Salem Community College. Paul has authored three books, an autobiography in 2007 titled No Green Berries or Leaves, an educational resource in 2014 titled Spark the Creative Flame, and most recently released, Studio Craft as Career, a guide to achieving excellence in art making. We're very fortunate to have Paul here with us this evening. I'm looking forward to this presentation, as I'm sure you all are as well. So I'll let him take it from here. Um, please join me in welcoming Mr. Paul Stankard. Can I use your little clappy thingy? <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Kristen, uh, you know, I'm very. This is exciting. It's kind of new for me, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm delighted to share my, uh, my career with uh, interested people and talk about Salem Community College's GLASS program and also overview uh, artists who are doing significant work in the flame work, using the flame working process. So let me begin by how do I do this? Let me go to Hold on, I gotta, I'm gonna get your presentation up right now, Paul. Okay. So celebrating flame work glass treasures. And uh, for those who uh, aren't familiar with the flame working process, the glass, the glass world's compro comprised of a lot of different tribes. And flame working is one of the, one of the tribes like blowing, flame working, casting, fusing, co-working, flame working is experiencing a renaissance. Is literally thousands of people who are beginning, finding their creative spirit, taking advantage of flame working. It's very, very exciting. And the narrowest hinge of my hand puts to scorn all machinery. This sentence is from one of Wall Whitman's most Respected Poems, Song of Myself. I'm Paul Stankard. I'd like to share with you the process and techniques that I have both perfected and developed. These techniques have enabled me to create this glass orb that I have titled Orchid Bouquet Cluster. The process that I use to create my botanical art, it's called flame working. And here I'm taking commercially available colored glasses, melting them into what I call material preparation. Here I'm making the green glass rods to press out leaves for the design. When I'm focusing on a blossom, I take advantage of colored glasses rolled into powder glasses, and that gives me a variety of shades. Here I'm focusing on the blossom. I'm taking the lip of the blossom and sealing sepals and petals onto the lip. And by heating the petals and shaping it, I'm developing a paphiopetalum orchid. Once I have the blossom finished, I put it in an annealing oven 
and anneal it at 975 Fahrenheit so that it becomes stable. When I flame worked all the components, I bring them to the hot plate on my bench and by keeping it hot with a Bunsen burner underneath, I attach the botanical components into the design. Once the components are finished into a design, I bring it to a pickup oven where it is going to be encapsulated in clear glass. My assistant is preheating clear glass to be dropped onto the colored glass design and encapsulate the orchids. We repeat the process with two halves sealed together and shaping it into the final orb. In the studio, I take advantage of two heat sources, the glory hole and the gas oxygen bench burner. The heat involved is upwards of 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, shaping the glass into a sphere. By putting two halves together, I'm able to suggest the design is 360 degrees. Magnification plays an important role in the presentation of the design. Once the orb is shaped, it goes into the oven to anneal for 40 hours. Once the glass is annealed, it's then ground and polished to be finished. You know, uh, Salem Community College, I graduated in 1963, and uh, I, was, I was trained to do scientific glass blowing, and I loved it. I was, uh, I left, I graduated in 63, worked in production that, uh, that really uh, complemented my, raised my skill level and eventually, I ended up uh, at uh, Robin Haas uh, in the research department in Philadelphia. And um, all through the 60s, I was fascinated by the creative side. And I would make small glass animals and things of that nature. And when my wife, Pat, and I uh, uh, moved into our new home in Mantua, New Jersey, the first thing I did was build a, a workbench and, uh, and started focusing on paperweights. But uh, Salem Community College's glass program, uh, President Contini, I had lunch with President Contini in, uh, I don't know, 97, 98. And we had a fascinating discussion. He planned to have a, uh, a group talk about the glass program and I was uh, a proponent of glass art and I said you know uh, Dr. Contini working with your hands whether it's scientific or, or the, on the creative side it's all skill so he his vision was to expand the glass program and eventually expand it over in Alloway New Jersey and what was so fascinating about the Alloway site. There was a few farms away from Worcesterburg, the early foundations of Worcesterburg Glass, the first successful glass company in the North American hemisphere. And here we have uh, in Southern New Jersey, the Salem Community College's glass program. Uh, and then uh, uh, President Contini passed the baton to um, President Bailey who added to the program. She added glass art and uh, hired uh, additional faculty who passed the baton to uh, President Gorman, who's, uh, who brought it back to, expanded the program, brought it back on campus. 
So I was congratulating Mike one day. I said, Mike, great job. He said, ah, oh, I just added scaffolding onto the existing scaffolds. <laughs> and it was, and I always thought that it, I was so proud to, to be involved, uh, enjoy sharing my experience with uh, the glass, my glass experience with the school. So I'm going to show you uh, four and a half minute uh, before we get to my, my pot. Welcome to the Samuel and Jean Jones Glass Education Center at Salem Community College. I'm Kristen Deedy, the Glass Education Administrator and a proud graduate of SCC's Glass Art Program. The 20,000 square foot facility is fully dedicated to glass education. The center opened on SCC's main campus in the fall of 2019. The Jones Glass Center is home to the college's one-of-a-kind scientific glass technology program and glass art program. The college also hosts many glass workshops and events throughout the year, including the International Flame Working Conference. We will start our tour in the building's front portion. One of the major enhancements compared with the previous center is the glass gallery, which showcases our students' work and enables us to display the work of emerging and established artists working with glass. Our lobby houses the college's glass collections, including work created by scientific glass and glass art alumni, current students, and by visiting artists and guest instructors. Salem Community College is home to the Stankard Glass Collection. This incredible collection of contemporary glass with a focus on flame arch glass was generously donated to the college by distinguished alum, Paul J. Stankard and his wife, Patricia. Paul graduated from SCC's scientific glass program in 1963 and went on to work as a research glass blower. On evenings and weekends, he worked on developing his botanical paperweights. And after 10 years, he pursued his creative endeavor full time. Paul's work is now included in over 70 permanent museum collections worldwide. Paul has been a great champion of Salem Community College and serves as the Glass Center's artist in residence. He generously spends time with our students, teaching technique and sharing his experience. Paul is a great supporter of the students in both glass focused programs. The facility includes two classrooms. The first serves as a flexible space for class meetings, presentations and lectures. The second classroom includes several computers, a 3D printer, and a dedicated space for students to photograph their work. The front portion also includes several offices where Glass Center staff and faculty are available for help with academics, technical issues, and advising. Now we enter the Paul J. Stankard Studio and Lab. This incredible 15,000 square foot space houses four glass studio areas, as well as a fabrication studio and a shared studio space for students. SCC has a strong focus on flame marking with its long-standing scientific glass technology program, which dates to 1959. In fact, SCC is home to the only degree program in the United States solely focused on the development of this unique skill. Students at SCC come from throughout the United States and from around the world to take part in this one-of-a-kind program. The Glass Art Program also has a strong focus in flame working, as well as in all other areas of working with the material creatively. The instruction of flame working in the Glass Art Program sets it apart from all other glass programs in the United States. The facility includes two flame working classrooms. Each classroom area contains 20 bench stations for students, as well as an instructor bench for class demonstrations. Each station includes both a bench burner and a hand torch. The entire area is well ventilated and each hood is fully lit from underneath, allowing for an excellent work environment. Between the two flame working classrooms is the lathe area, which currently houses six lathes, complete with all necessary torches and accessories, including ribbon and cradle burners. The glass center also houses a hot shop for glass blowing. This area houses a 400 pound tank furnace, as well as a double pot furnace for batching colored glass, four working benches, a garage, two pickup ovens, six large annealers, along with many assorted tools and other glass making goodies. The Glass Center's cold working studio houses everything needed for working with cold glass, 
including the tools necessary for cutting, grinding, polishing, engraving, sandblasting, enameling, adhesive work, and more. I just want to jump in here. So we're um, we're going to skip ahead now, but I'll I'll put the the link for the entire tour for the Glass Center in the chat box if anyone wants to, to check it out. Um, find it on our website. Here you go, so Bob. I uh, I left I left Salem with uh, with uh, skills for to uh, work in the scientific glass field. You know, it's interesting. I think about this once in a while. Salem Community College's 60 year history of training young men and women, and some not so young, in the uh, craft of scientific glass uh, has contributed to America's science. These uh, skilled craftspeople have gone into industry, research, and produced the apparatus that the scientists require to do their experiments. It's a fascinating story how this little community college trains people to do the scientific glass. And also now with the furnace working, also they cross pollinate. Uh, and many students will stay a third year to take the uh, glass blowing or scientific. So next. So here's my little bench, you know, and I, we, uh, we're located in southern New Jersey, where we have a rich glass tradition. And paperweights, the paperweights are the crown jewel of that glass tradition. The Millville Rose, the Devil Fire, there's a lot of different uh, designs. So I wanted to make paperweights, and I really didn't know how to do it. So I started experimenting, and I was making giftware prior to the paperweights. And I was making little glass animals, and I initially made a few paperweights with animals. And then when I experimented with a flower, that daisy to the right, all of a sudden my world <laughs> had so much energy to do flowers. I just somehow connected with that idea. Next. And so over the course of my career, it was important for me to educate myself to the things I care about. And that's uh, art making. Um, I started listening to uh, uh, audible bo books on uh, audibly, the classics, uh, I, and I started writing poetry. And somewhere along the line, I thought, if I'm going to write poetry, I should know who the, who the great poets are in America. And I came across Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman inspires me to this day. He's the patron saint in my studio. One of the things that I've enjoyed going in the woods, especially if it's virgin woods, you're standing there and you sense the quiet, primal sanity, and you feel humbled by the this help. <laughs> what a short time we are on this earth compared to the, the trees. So women's, women's sentence really touched me. Give me solitude. Give me nature. Give me again, O oh nature, your primal sanity. Primal sanity is what I feel when I walk into the woods. The, um, another favorite sentence in talking to myself is, a morning glory at my window satisfies me more than the metaphysics of books. So thank you, Walt. Next. So here's a retrospective collection of my work. It represents about, I think, about 35 years. And upper left is uh, I started focusing on the uh, individual native flowers, the plants. And first it was the blossoms, buds, stems, and then the roots. So I started to really get excited about portraying uh, the native flowers uh, as um, as credible as I was able to do. And then the work became more ambitious as time went on and to the upper right on, I started doing more ambitious work with two sides, view, views of two sides. Here's a winter squash with a damsel fly. And on the lower left, uh, the botanical series opened up my world 
to uh, producing more ambitious work. And I found out that I could work on one half one day, put it in the annealing oven, hold it at the annealing temperature, work on the second half, the bottom half, and then take the top Ooh, half out of the oven and put it together. Oil. And okay. it really, it really worked. So, uh, and then from 2000 on, the orbs, the orbs came, came about by a beautiful person who I'm friendly with named um, uh, Robert Steffen. Robert Steffen has his glass. And Robert came to the studio, I bought uh, quite a bit of co-working equipment from Robert. And he showed us a few tricks of the trade. So as we were walking out of the studio, he saw a cube on my bench. He said, Paul, why don't you let me take this cube back to my studio and I'll turn it into a sphere, an orb. I said, sure. So, <laughs> so a short time later, when I received the orb in the mail, I stopped making paperweights because I was so fascinated by the idea that the glass was 360 and the magnification was really fascinating to me. It magnified the design by 30%, I think. Okay, next. And uh, the figures and masks, I started to uh, put um, symbols into the designs. Um, the assemblage on the left has masks, figures, insects, the whole, my whole menu. <laughs> and then on the right is a, below the roots, I have a, a vegetation patch. And under that patch, I put a little figure. And I couldn't help but really relate to the emotions of that human form. It really touched me. Next. Oh, this is a nice story for me. I think, wow. So I got, a, I got an email from a student at Salem. He said, Paul, do you have a tattoo of your design on your arm? I said, no. He said, well, it was in a tattoo magazine. <laughs> and uh, I said, really? So I tracked down the design to a tattoo artist in Man Manhattan. Uh, and uh, she was um, very talented. I assume she took a stencil of my design and then laid it out and tattooed the arm. So it turns out it was a student, uh, at, this woman came back from the military. She had uh, the tattoo done and she went, attended Salem Community College and she visited my studio and uh, with her class, I imagine, and, and decided she was gonna get that design tattooed on her arm. I couldn't have been half, I thought it was so flat. Next. So here's uh, an eight inch orb, which I call it a swarm. I have about 25 honeybees buzzing around the center. <clears throat> it's a core. I have honeycombs, blossoms, and, and uh, blueberries. And that's a major effort. Uh, it, it was commissioned by a dear friend, Walt, uh, Robert Minkoff, who recently passed away. And uh, I think of Robert more than occasionally. And to the right is, um, a, is um, my response to 9-11. Doug Heller in New York, Heller Gallery in New York City, after 9-11 asked the artists he represented to respond to the 9-11 tragedy. So this was my entry into that. This is my entry into the gallery and it didn't sell, which is not, not a big deal. So I had it in my home for about two years and a collector from Chicago came by, looked at it and says, oh my goodness, can I buy that? <laughs> he says, <"You> sure, that's <laughs> how I make a living. So I, I sold them the, uh, the, the piece, the masks and his collection was donated. He, got, he passed away a couple of years ago and the family donated the collection to the uh, Henry Ford Museum. And they built a big glass display and they have a gallery uh, in an additional building. And this piece is uh, in the gallery uh, identified as sculpture. 
So that was people have commented seeing it in the get in the Henry Ford Museum. Next. Recent work really been exciting for me. I'm, I tell people I'm only 77 and I, I have, um, I have uh, my assistant who had been my assistant for 25 years, David Graber, has his own career. He does paperweights, he does beautiful work. And David comes in once a week with my son, Joe, and they help me put the piece together. And uh, I really feel fortunate that uh, I can take advantage of, of the uh, Joe and David's talent. But I'm working in the studio in a very leisurely pace. These two pieces are a tribute to uh, Emily Dickinson and Walt Women, two poets that uh, celebrate transcendentalism in their, in their poetry. Walt Whitman more so than Emily Dickinson. But my focus has been uh, color, delicacy, uh, transcendental, uh, ambiguity, ambigu help me out, ambiguousness, <laughs> ambiguousness. <laughs> now, now that I'm 77, I'm losing, I'm losing a few words along the way. But anyway, uh, this is really interesting. Not next. Oh, this is a uh, a three minute video on making a video. Okay. So this has been a challenge for me because I want to integrate the human forms into my floral design, into the into the uh, moss and flowers. And I've been working very hard to make sense of it. Fascinating at this stage of my career after spending a few years in Germany and Asia. I was moving away from them. So, this is I developed a technique that I can prepare for the technique. I'm making a little, making a little, little, little groups and then. Uh, building the moss around them. Next. Okay, uh, these attitudes were, were hard won, and I share them with my students. Educate yourself to the things you care about. This is about being the best you can be. Educate yourself to the things you care about. Art making is solving one technical problem after another. The more personal your artwork, the more universal it becomes. To do excellent work, you have to know what excellence is. Pursuing excellence will allow one's work to transcend all categories. We all can do better. 
and my best work is in the color bucket. If you want, take your take. You can photograph that uh, with your iPhones, and uh, you might you might uh, enjoy uh, thinking about it. Next. So it's been a fascinating journey, and so it goes. It really has been a fascinating journey. My wife said to me about, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, she says, Paul, you need a hobby. <laughs> she says, all you do is talk about class. I said, well, this is my hobby. <laughs> so the, the, uh, my wife, Pat, has really been a tremendous support. We have five children living in Mantua. Uh, we live in Mantua, and it's really been a, a fascinating journey that Hopefully, uh, I can still, uh, my best work's in front of me. Next. So here's Lauren Stumps. He's quite a talent. Lauren makes portrait canes, among other things. I called Lauren up and said, Lauren, would you make me a cursive Paul Stanker signature cane? He said, sure. So he made this cursive Paul Stanker, and he sent it to me. I probably have enough for three or four lifetimes. But he sent me the canes, and now since November of 2020 to the future, this cane will identify the, I don't know if it sounds strange, my last, the last phase of my career. And my dream is that the work will continue to mature, and I'll continue to discover ways to be creative. Next. So here's 18th and 19th century framework glass, courtesy of the Corning Museum of Glass. The Marie Antoinette uh, tabloid, fascinating work. This work was done uh, with uh, minimal, minimal tools, without computers. I mean, some of this work from the past is the best it can be. And then in the center, the beggar, that's about three inches high. And that is in, in the Nevere figurine uh, category. The, um, the wealthy were buying porcelain, porcelain uh, statues, little porcelain statues from China. And they were very, very expensive. So the glassmakers started making, making them in glass and it became a huge market for them. And then to the right, the, uh, the Pantan paperweight, that's a flame worked lizard that had been cut, the scales had been cut and polished and, uh, and then encapsulated in a, in, a, uh, in a paperweight. So my job, and I, I, really, I don't know how I got the idea, but in the mid 70s, it was, I wanted so much to build on the tradition and to do, to be, match the best of the past. Next. Uh, the uh, Gla Rudolph and uh, Leopold and Rudolf Blasker commissioned uh, the Harvard, Harvard University Peabody Museum commissioned uh, fl flowers, floral uh, models from the Blaskers in Germany. I think they were, uh, uh, what's the, well, anyway, in Germany. So everybody interested in, in glass flowers should make a pilgrimage to the Blaster collection at Harvard University. Uh, next, <clears throat> they started doing sea, sea life. They were known for sea life. Their models would find their way into museums. And they once they got the commission to do... Uh, the flowers for the Peabody Museum at Harvard, they stopped everything and focused on the flowers. Next. <coughs> Lucio Babaco, he's uh, quite a friend. Lucio is a friend of Salem Community College. He has a, uh, a, an honorary associate's degree in glass art. He's taught at Salem. Here we are at Wheat Knots. And you know, um, I can't say enough about Salem Community College glass program and wheat knots. I 
educated myself by going to Wheaton House and, and experiencing glass blowing and, and glass history, South Jersey history. But Lucio uh, was, both Lucio and I were working at the Wheatons together. Next. <clears throat> and he, uh, he's, he's uh, famous for his figures, myth. He's very, very skilled uh, with uh, the, the human form and, and the myth surrounding it. And what he did was he, he developed a vehicle to show his work in a theatrical way. And it's interesting, he makes goblets and, and vessels and he arranges to have the figures holstered in the goblets. It's fascinating and it's really, a, he's, his, his figures are as good as the historical best. Next. Cesare Tofalo, another talented artist from Murano. Both Cesare and uh, Lucio are from Murano. And I think the island of Murano, the future of that glass experience will be flame working. His flame working is, is responsible for a lot of really good work. Uh, uh, Vittorio Constantini, uh, Cesare Tofalo, Lucio Babaco, and a host of others. Next. I love this photograph, Matt Escuti. You know, I've had, the, had the, the honor and the pleasure of meeting most of these people through the uh, creative, through the IFC. So we have a yearly, it's funny, uh, real quick story. When we started, uh, Pete, uh, Dr. Contini uh, gave the okay for the IFC. So we had a very successful first conference. We had about 110 people. I think it actually made the, made the editorial uh, uh, page of the uh, Woodbury Times, or the Gloucester County Times. So I said to uh, uh, Dr. Pete, as I call him, Dr. Pete, you want to do it every two years? He says, no, why don't we do it every year? And when it slows down, we'll just skip it and do it every two years. It's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger because the International Frameworking Conference promotes excellence. It brings in the best people or the most, uh, well, best, best is a funny word, brings in masters and they share their experience. They interact with the students. We bring in uh, museum curators to talk about the field. So it's really fascinating. And Matt Mascuti's white trash, he calls it. <laughs> I think it's just, uh, Remarkable, that's all flame work glass. Next. Ginny Ruffner, Ginny Ruffner is a pioneer in the studio of glass movement. Remarkable talent. She's, uh, she uses borosilicate glass to make her sculptures and then she paints them. Paints them with, I don't know if it's an oil-based paint or not, but they're very, very uh, thought-provoking. Ginny was, uh, I think in 2010 or so, was commissioned to do a major sculpture in the city of Seattle. So she spent, you know, I don't know, probably a couple of years building this sculpture. And it's uh, probably multi-tons and 10 or 15, probably 20 feet high. Now the teapot uh, uh, pours water onto the flowers and the flowers open up and it's a 15 minute cycle. And this has become a source of great pride for the city of Seattle. It's so beautiful. She's really a talent. Next. Anna Sipska. Now, there's an inventive person. Anna came from uh, Poland. She was studying, I believe in an architectural school in Poland. And she wanted to work in glass. So Anna said to the professor, I'd like to work in glass. So he, the professor gave her an acetylene torch. So she busted glass bottles and started pulling them down. And she invented a technique to uh, network the glass. And all of a sudden, 
her work busted the scale uh, when she busted through the scale limitations. She can do, she's responsible for having hot glass do some of the largest, largest uh, sculptures. And it does, I'm probably close to doing the smallest work. She's, she's able to do the largest work. And it's fascinating how she's influenced the field. Next. Uh, David Willis, David's out in uh, uh, Oregon. I think Eugene, he's very, very talented. He does a variety of work. And this example, this is a, I believe it's a stage uh, setting on the right. And then he has his, uh, his balloon shaped, um, or, uh, what would we call them? Teardrops, maybe teardrop shaped uh, glass hanging off uh, uh, the ceiling of a building. He's very, very talented. And uh, he's been at the IFC. Next. Brent Key Young. Brent is, uh, he was, uh, he retired from uh, Cleveland Art Institute in, this, in the, I don't know, late 70s, 80s. He worked out uh, flame working. He flame worked uh, images that that um, reference fossils, and he had skills in blowing glass. So he would blow vessels. He would coat the coat the uh, surface of the first gather. He would roll the hot glass over his flame worked components, and he ended up with these imprinting imprinting the vessel. Uh, the vessel imagery into the uh, into the vase. It's remarkable. And then uh, I don't know when he started doing the networking glass, but he does large scale geometric forms, and they're fascinating. Next, Susan Edgerly. She's from Canada. Very talented woman. I had the pleasure of being in, I, I always enjoyed going to Sofa Chicago, sculptural objects, functional art. And the gallery was showing my work and, and the Habitat Gallery and next door was a gallery from Canada. And I, and I was standing, my work was close to Susan Edgerly's uh, work and I had a chance to talk to her. And I was fascinated by what she was able to do. She's very, very uh, straightforward flame working and building these large, uh, to me, they're symbolic of uh, rituals. They're, it's fascinating. Uh, next. Amber Cohen, Amber's taught at Salem. Amber, uh, really was involved early on in, in glass making and she went to Urban Glass and went to work in Brooklyn and, um, and then decided she was going to get a master's degree and came down to uh, Tyler School of Art in uh, the Temple University and, and where she teaches to this day. But Amber's uh, inventing a whole new visual vocabulary for, for glass art. And primarily it's flame work glass and she takes advantage of color. She'll go to uh, West Virginia and buy and load up on color for like very, 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 very inexpensively. Take it back to a studio and rework it into her panels. They're very, very dramatic. Next. Oh, this is wonderful work, I think. Uh, Matsushima. Iowa Matsushima. Up in the left is the uh, cores, the core forms. He takes the puntles and he mounts steel wool on the end of the puntle. And then he dips it in clay and he builds the, the, the mold in clay. And then in uh, flame work, he has a, Japan uses a very uh, low melting point glass. 
I think that uh, they can work it with a gas ear torch. He uses a Bunsen burner to melt his glass rods around the core. He anneals the glass and then takes it out of the annealing oven, separates it from the mold, and then he polishes the inside of the form. And uh, he's brought core forming into the 21st century. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, result. If you have a chance, look, look up these people and, and familiarize yourself with their work. Next. Common Loza, I think her work is exceptional, especially her facial gestures. She's got so much emotion. I've never seen a sculpted, framework sculpted uh, head or body as successful as Common. She, uh, she takes borosilicate glass and she sculpts out the, the, the form pays a special attention to the, the facial gestures, and then she paints it with uh, oil-based paints. And I love, I think uh, Salem Community College is, in, uh, is looking forward to having those, that series of uh, tea, uh, teacups in their all <laughs> Patricia Stankin contemporary glass collection. So that's, that's gonna be fun. Now, you know, uh, talking about school to students, you know, the, the, the glass displayed at the school, these young people have a chance to see masters, master work, and they're inspired by it. And uh, I'm really, uh, Kristen Didi, the director of the Glass Center, tells me that many people, a lot of the students, before they go through the doors to the, into the workshop, into the studio, they stop and study the the glass on display. And it's very important to know what good is. Next. Trina Urata Weintraub, what a talent. She makes, uh, she and her husband, uh, the husband told me he, he took my workshop at Penland. I complimented, I complimented her on the on the flowers and he said, well, that's my husband's work. He took your workshop. I thought, wow, he really, he got his money's worth. They're beautiful, very, very delicate flowers. So uh, Trina makes these uh, bunny rabbits, I guess, and there are all sorts of gestures and the, the, the emotion that these these sculptures uh, ex radiate are fascinating. And then she makes mice. I'd like to get a couple of the mice. Maybe I'll work on that, save my money for that one. Okay, thanks, next. You know, there's so much talent in the flame working world. This is a renaissance. This process is experiencing a renaissance in, uh, great work and most of it is uh, taking this uh, 17th, 16th, 17th, 18th century process into the 21st century. Uh, Janice uh, uh, Miltenberger, her cages are wonderful. There's a, she's got a cardinal positioned in a nest in the cage. And I'm glad that cages open so the cardinal, when nobody's looking, can fly out. <laughs> But it's really remarkable work, and it, they're large scale, they're a couple of feet high. And then uh, 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 Kathleen Elliott, her, her fruit is so luscious, and the, the attention to detail is remarkable. I had an interesting conversation with Kathleen Elliott. She told me she was introduced to glass from bead making, and bead making is a huge area that has a lot of talent, but uh, Kathleen was challenged by the process and took it further than, uh, took it into the, uh, into the sculptural realm. They're wonderful pieces. Next. This is interesting. Amy Lemire teaches at Salem. Actually, Amy is teaching 
uh, she's teaching uh, neon. She's going to uh, electrify, what's the word? I don't even have the vocabulary for it. She's going to introduce neon to not only scientific glass, but glass art and illuminate it. And this is an example of one of her sculptures illuminated with neon, neon gas. And she's a remarkably talented person and has taught at Salem now for quite a few years. And you know, it's a shame that COVID, uh, the COVID-19 thing has really screwed things up, but Salem's coming out of it. And uh, it's gonna take a while, but they're coming out of it. Kit, Kit Paulson, I love this candelabra, this candle holder. And I can imagine this on my table Fancy, fancy dinner party, and lumin <laughs> have the candle illuminate the, the, the glass vegetation. So beautiful. And then Madeline Ryle Smith, Madeline just recently graduated from, I think, uh, Rhode Island School, no, from uh, Alfred with a master's degree. And uh, she's inventing, she's focused on uh, instruments glass instruments, and here she's invented a glass instrument for three. <laughs> I think that this is waiting for a composer to make history in music. <laughs> so, next. Jay Musler. Jay's a master. Jay was working in the factory and he wanted to uh, do his own work. He was working in a production factory making goblets and things. He wanted to do his own work. So he set up a flame working uh, studio in a garage. And all of a sudden, he started to really hit home runs with, the, uh, with his imagery. This uh, cityscape was a, a bell jar, a, a borosilicate bell jar, corning producers. He cut it in half and he. Uh, he cut the rim to reference a city and then sandblasted it uh, with uh, sandblasted it and then uh, airbrushed it. What do you call that? Airbrushing. Airbrushing. Airbrushed the colors. And then to the right, one of his uh, idio idiosyncrat idiosyncratic containers, he's got a wonderful, peculiar result to his work. Next. Chris Aholt, wow, I love the balloon idea. <laughs> Here's this rhinoceros floating above a weight. And Chris, wonderfully talented, he blows the body of the animal on the lathe. He takes it off the lathe and then by hand at the bench, he creases it and he adds horns and he does this and that and he shapes it into the final, final. Product. That's that's um, red glass, not paint. And then Shane Ferro, he's a master. Shane has been a really good friend, very talented uh, artist, who also is a writer. So Shane's uh, working with birds, and I just I keep up with a lot of people on Facebook. It's fascinating. Shane teaches at Salem in the summer program, and uh, his birds are very very poetic. But he just did a bird that I don't, I, I believe he used gold leaf. It looked like gold leaf to me. Next. Aha, paperweights. You know, this whole flame working community is, we have tribes. We have the paperweight makers. We have uh, uh, the, the bead makers. We have the goblet makers, you know, it's all sorts of different um, tribes within the flame working community. And then more tribes in the overall glassway, glassway community. Rick Ayotte, dear friend, I met Rick in the 60s, early 60s. We worked together in uh, McAllister Bicknell in 1963. And Rick's new work, which is fascinating, he takes a white, white disc he paints it with uh, uh, oxides, uh, high-firing oxides, 
And then he flame worked a little cardinal and placed it in the design and he picked it up and made a paperweight out of it. It's remarkable. I believe it's in the collection of the Berkstone Mahler Museum right now, or in that collection. His daughter, Missy, very talented young lady, continuing on, uh, continuing with the uh, paperweight tradition. And she, this reminds me of a wedding bouquet. Or it's just so beautiful, all the, uh, how she arranged the white colors. And then my assistant, Dave Graber, his fruit are really remarkable. He's doing a fruit series. And uh, Dave has the talent of uh, very, very fine work. He, he's very meticulous about his work and uh, very successful, I'm happy to say. Uh, so these are oranges. And then the lower, the lower left is Gordon Smith. He graduated from Salem Community College. And Gordon's doing a remarkable job. These are uh, koi, koi fish. And then center is Debbie Tossitano. Debbie's in, uh, outside of Boston, Massachusetts. She's been a, a, one of the pioneers in the studio paperweight making. She does, she's particularly interested in colors and uh, her work is very distinctive. Uh, and then Kathy Richardson. Kathy is, uh, this is a underwater sea life and who's also successful and her work is distinctive. So it's amazing how there are so many different communities within the flame working, the overall flame working community. Next. Oh, this is sweet. Kiva Ford, Kiva's a graduate from Salem. And he, uh, currently he's a scientific glass blower at uh, Notre Dame University. So he's very talented. And, and while he's not doing scientific glass, he's uh, doing his own creative work. This is a container with flowers, very attractive. And then to the, to the middle, Gerald, I call him Jerry, Jerry Ward, Gerald Ward is remarkable for his roses. I met, I met Jerry at the IFC and uh, very pleasant. He and his wife, Joyce, are uh, supporters of the uh, Salem program. And his roses, I think, are the best they can be. Very convincing. And then Kim Fields, Kim Fields' work is exceptional. She does, she's uh, meticulous in her, uh, in her interpretation of nature. It's, it's really, uh, the, the, I would love to get that butterfly in one of my pieces. God almighty. I wonder if Kim could make it smaller. <laughs> Boy, would that be the cat's meow? <laughs> Boy, there's so much talent out there, it's scary. Next. <laughs> Oh, this is so beautiful. I mean, my heart flutters. Uh, uh, Kenan Tymeyer, Kenan's work is, is he makes marbles, orbs. He uses uh, gold leaf and silver leaf. And he vaporizes the precious metals onto the glass and then encapsulates it. And he gets these fascinating colors. This is so spiritual from my perspective. And the colors, the radi how the colors radiate. It's a whole new, I'm looking at this with fresh eyes. I've never seen anything quite like it. It's so beautiful. So anyway, next. Oh, this is cute. This is really, a, uh, this is quite a story. David uh, Colton. How am I doing on time? You know, uh, I wanted to write, I wanted to talk about the, uh, well, let's talk about David's work. David was commissioned by the Ray Cow. Uh, David uh, Colton was the recipient of the Ray Cow Award, uh, sponsored by Corning, Corning Glass Museum. Uh, each year they commission a, a glass artist to make a major piece to include into the museum's collection. So David was the uh, recipient of that award. 
And David is a pipe maker, a Boris, uh, what do they call it? They call it cannabis pipe maker. And this sculpture, which is about uh, 12 inches long, maybe 10 inches high, uh, high and 10 inches deep. I'm sorry, I don't have the correct dimensions. And this is a functional pipe. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the cannabis pipes, but it's huge. It's a, it's a field that is, I think, the largest community of uh, glassmakers uh, there are. I asked uh, Abe Fleischman, who's uh, part owner of North Stars, how, if he could estimate the number of uh, uh, craftspeople making cannabis pipes. He said, oh, it's got to be over 25,000 people. I said, really? I kind of believe it because in my little county, all of a sudden I'm seeing two tobacco shops opening up and they're filled with these borosilicate glass pipes to smoke cannabis. So this is a huge area that I don't know a whole lot about. Um, I started to identify some of the people, but I, re I realized that, God, I've got to... I better let Corning sift through and make the make the calls because I don't I don't know I don't want to talk about things I really don't know about. Uh, I, when I smoked pot, oh, this is a secret. When I smoked pot in 1964, I got paranoid. <laughs> so I never smoked it again. <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> So here it is. This is, uh, this is my way of sharing. I wrote three books, uh, No Green Berries or Leaves. It's my autobiography. Came out in 2007. Uh, and Sparked the Creative Flame, Making the Journey from Craft to Watt. I identified 12, flame, uh, 12 artists who have international reputations that all take advantage of the flame working process. So I recommend that book, particularly that book for flame working. And then Studio Crafter's Career Overviews of American Craft, glass, metal, wood, ceramic, jewelry. And this was, uh, you know, it was, a, and I had the artists make statements and I, I uh, wrote an appreciation for the work. So I like to, I enjoy writing. I enjoy it, I think I enjoy it. <laughs> It's difficult. It's difficult, but it's done. It's great when you're done. So that's uh, next. I think that's the end of it. Um, you can go on my website, uh, paulstanker.com, and and check things out. But um, I'm so happy to be able to share my experiences with you, your your audience. It's really nice. Oh, I see my son. I got, hi, Joe. I'm glad you're here. So it's really been a nice, it's really been a, a fascinating preparation. I see Sharon Owens. She's uh, from uh, Indianapolis. So all my old friends. <laughs> so any questions, I'll be happy to ask some questions. Kristen, how are you doing on time? We're, we're doing fine on time. We're a little over an hour. Um, I've still got time. I've got energy. Um, I've made it, I did the settings to anybody who has an, a question, you can unmute yourself and fire away. I had nice memories of the production world. It was, uh, Andrew Black was interesting. John, John Smith was the president of the director. So, uh, it was hard work. And, and you know, uh, Sheila. <laughs> Hey, people, mute your mute your things. She, uh, somebody's not muted. Sheloid was next door, and in the summertime, they would spew out so much pollution that it would float into Andrew's glasses work area, and the and the flames would flicker with all this pollution. It was crazy, and now I think they uh, they ended that company. Yeah, they uh, polluted a lot in that area. Oh, wow. Well, you could see it in the flames. The flames would sparkle. So it must have been contaminants, in, uh, you know, 
metal floating in the atmosphere. <laughs> anyway. Another May one. I ask a question, Mr. Stankard? Yes. I am curious how you have kept your hands and body basically in good shape for uh, all the work you do. My thumbs are killing me. <laughs> you know, uh, one, of the, one of my great uh, hobbies, a real joy for me, I played handball, full world handball for about 35 years and I gave it up. Now I walk at the Chestnut Branch. So I, I do walking, but I, I believe in exercise. And um, do you do anything specifically for your hands though, to keep them? Exercises? Or... Yeah, work. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I just work, you know. I, I, I notice, uh, no, I'm fine as far as that. Uh, I do, I wish I had a little bit more uh, I wish I wouldn't forget words sometimes. It can be embarrassing, but I think it comes- Well, I do want to say I am on page 81 of your book right now. Oh, are you enjoying it? I am in very much enjoying it. I just, I read that part about the sparkling uh, pollution and I thought that was pretty funny. Oh, God, yeah. You know, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite uh, chapters is a tribute to uh, uh, talking about uh, Dr. Contini inviting me to be involved at Sim. And I see Pete in the, uh, in the frame here, Pete. Yeah, I think he was going to say something. You know, uh, is, is you're Yeah, really, he would like to ask a question next. Uh, you know, it, I really have enjoyed my career. And my wife, uh, I give my wife so much credit because she, uh, in addition to raising the children, helped out in the business, she still does. And my daughter Pauline now works as an administrator. She works part time. So I have a lot of support. And that's, uh, you know, and I really enjoy the community. What a community. You know, these kids that are, so, uh, these young people learning about uh, glass making at Salem, they're going to they're gonna shine when they go out into the community because as as because I cared about what I was being taught. And I wasn't a great student, but I, when I went into industry, I knew so much more than the people that didn't have a formal education. And all of a sudden, I was a smart guy, <laughs> which was kind of a novel thing for me. But anyway, it was a, it's a beautiful community. There we go. Good evening. Can you hear me, Paul? I can hear you, Pete. Thank you. Yes. I've got the baddies with me here, and I uh, oh. just wanted to make a couple observations. First of all, that very first time I ever met Paul Stankert, I came home that night and I said to my wife, I had just met a guy who I've heard about for years, but I feel like I've known him my whole life. That's the impression that you left with me almost immediately. And I guess the best way to describe it is that you were uh, modest, humble. More importantly, uh, you care about people. And that has been one thing that has led the relationship that Salem has had with you because of your interest in sharing with students. Uh, all the other things are great and important. You brought people to the campus. You opened the door to uh, Salem's notoriety with regards to glass. But it's all about Paul Stankard's willingness to share. And you told me early on, and I didn't understand it first, that within a glass community, there wasn't always that sharing people were pretty protective about what they were doing and how they did it. We broke through all that, Paul, and that's something that you you bring with you in everything you've touched. So uh, for those about 14 and a half years that you and I worked together, uh, you were pretty humble the way you described what happened. Trust me, it well, was you're, because you're. of your uh, genuineness and the oh, way in which you care about people that really led us to where you are today. 
Well, let me share so something. Salem has seen you for what it is. That's true well, treasure. Thank you, Dr. Pete. I appreciate you know, your, your leadership, very much. Your leadership in the beginning was gutsy, and the IFC was um, a commitment that uh, the support that you and staff, Salem staff, I also wanted to remiss if I didn't say how much I enjoyed working with uh, Bill Clark. You know, Bill and I would, uh, in the early days. Uh, hang up here. Can you hear me, Pete? Well, anyway, it, you know, it's a, it was a very, I still enjoy Salem. Uh, Dr. Mike is a very, you know, you people are class act. And uh, I've learned as much as uh, anybody. I think that's what keeps, keeps my work fresh. The question was about our really incredible summer programs um, that unfortunately we had to cancel last year due to the pandemic. Um, we have not scheduled anything for this summer yet. New Jersey has a quarantine order um, that we abide by strictly being um, a government institution, being a college. Um, so it's it's going to be a costly burden for people to take a trip to southern New Jersey for 10 days and then pay to stay another seven to take a workshop. So we're just, you know, we're doing the all we can to make an amazing um, experience for our students that are here right now. Um, people who are local are actually able to take advantage of our semester long classes. So if you're not far from here, um, if you're in a neighboring state or in New Jersey and you'd like to take a class, I highly recommend taking any of our 15 week classes. They meet once a week. Um, and then you have the ac access to the center six days a week. Uh, so we've, we've had some extra people jumping in and taking advantage of that lately. And uh, we hope to bring back the, the workshops as soon as we can. I, I miss them. I think it's, a, it's, it's just a high energy, um, experience to be able to hang out with somebody like Paul for five straight days. We get up early in the morning and keep at it till late at night. So keep an eye on our um, social media channels. And as soon as we uh, have something scheduled again, we'll be shouting it off the rooftops. I hope that's soon. Oh, Paul, you're muted. Uh, Kristen, I've always enjoyed the summer workshops. Yeah. That was so sweet. Shane, Shane Farrow, and also Lucio Babaco teaching with them. They let me take a nap after lunch. <laughs> they covered for me. That was the big secret. Yeah, you we know, like to uh, <laughs> I want to give a shout out to my friend Robert Tull, who uh, we became good friends exercising at uh, the gym. And now we're, we're, <laughs> Talking about what are we going to do to lose the weight? <laughs> oh, we stopped going to the gym. Anyway, any other questions? Uh, you have somebody on here who would like to know if you ever demonstrate on the West Coast. I have, uh, but I don't, uh, I don't, I haven't said this publicly, but I don't travel anymore. How about the Salem Community College? Hey, West Coast, can I can you drive to down Salem 90, I, can, <laughs> I can drive down 95, I mean, uh, 295 and get off at exit four in a heartbeat, but I don't want to fly around the country anymore. Actually, it's amazing. I've flown around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, this is uh, the glass community is international. And, you know, people who, you know, um, it's fascinating to realize that if you do something well, it will attract attention. And you know, the, one of the hardest jobs for me, I just saw uh, Sarah Sally Legrand and I thought, you know, one of the hardest, one of the challenges, I wasn't able to put into my flame working presentation half or maybe only a small portion of the people's work I respect. I just, there was so much good work out there that I couldn't, I didn't know how to finesse it. So uh, maybe we'll do something again, I don't know. But it's really amazing how much, it's, there is truly a renaissance uh, taking advantage of this process and the talent out there is phenomenal. Well, it sounds like people wanna see a demo, Paul. Maybe we'll have to do a demo night. 
<laughs> we're going, we can do it at Salem. Yeah, and, we're doing uh, demo night. Yeah, we've got all the cameras here now. We can make it really fancy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, this is fantastic. I've talked for an hour and a half. And uh, it's an honor for me to be here and share my world with you. So uh, I see my son out there. Joe, uh, we're working Friday morning, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> we're working Friday morning. I wonder if Dave Grave is on, on board, too. But you know, uh, uh, isn't it amazing what we're able to, how we communicate through the social media, Facebook, and uh, we can share images and ideas. It's really something. Um, it really is. Thank you all for joining us tonight and bearing with uh, bearing with the technology here. This is the first large meeting I've hosted. Um, we're going to have another event coming up. Uh, stay tuned. Um, we have your email addresses now, but uh, Paul will be presenting again later this spring, and we'll be excited to announce that. Um, oh, hi, Evelyn. <laughs> Evelyn. Hello, Evelyn. Hi. Boy. I miss you, Evelyn. I miss you too. We Paul. had some pretty profound conversations. <laughs> we do. Paul, how do you, what's your secret to your energy for doing everything? Everything. I take vitamins in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, just vitamins. <laughs> what time do you get up, Paul? I, I get up about 3 o'clock in the morning. Jeez. I'm an early bird. I get up at 3. I go to Wawa's. This is my secret. I go to Wawa's and get a coffee and bagel and, and I sit and meditate and start Coffee and bagel, bit. huh? And then I walk. I get up and I, I, I get up at three and then wait till 6.30 to go walking. But, uh, wow. It's a crazy schedule, but it works for me. And what time do you go to bed? Actually, it's bedtime right now. <laughs> <laughs> So we're around but six. But I didn't love. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah. Hey, Kristen, we really are so proud of you and how you're managing the Glass Center and expanding it. And hey, it's it's a, we have a good time here. We have a really good time here. If uh, if anyone's yeah. interested in learning more about the Glass Center and the Glass Program specifically, I see you. we have a uh, virtual session coming up, just an informational session on February 17th. You can find the link for the registration for that on uh, salemcc.edu forward wow. slash glass. And that's where you can find out everything else about what we do here, all the amazing things. So check it out. And thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you all for coming. And hopefully we will see you all very soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.